Yeah, I'd like to welcome you guys to, uh, to the first session, and uh, I'm going to say this is the most important session, but I've been known to be biased, so, so yeah, <laughs> take it as you want. Um, what really gives me goose flesh is when I prepared this little intro, um, is that we, um, I spoke to one of the growers about two weeks ago, and, and the message um, he gave me, um, yeah, it's like a carbon copy of what Guy Lindy just said. Um, I think uh, sustainability is absolutely key that we've got to look at. Um, I think what we also know, hand in hand with sustainability, we're also looking at, uh, at the fact that, uh, that the agricultural industry and, and crop protection as it is, is, is extremely dynamic and it's a changing process. Um, yeah, we don't have to look far what's happening. Um, I've been here for a number of years, but I, I saw what happened to, to for, for, for instance, the nut borer complex. Um, when I moved into macadamia, it was false codling moth, and it's really looking different now. We see mac nut borer going into citrus. We see mac nut borer going into uh, into other crops. Uh, we see different stink bugs in the coastal area than we see here. We see diseases coming in uh, that's giving us more trouble. Um, and from Samac side, um, I think it's quite important that we try and get this dynamism um, and into, into our research program. And I think the next three speakers um, really, really fits the bill. And with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Gerda Fouri. Gerda is heading uh, the research team at the University of Pretoria at, uh, at FABI. And um, she has got a difficult job of keeping a lot of students in line. Gerda, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Skolk. So good morning, Samak. For me, a privilege, and I'm really excited to share some of our research with you today. Um, I agree much better than the studio in Mitran from last year. So I was specifically asked to talk to you about our work on pheromones, EPFs, and parasitoids, and that's specifically to control sting bugs. So our first important step would be to identify the target pest. And that is done via grower scouting. So know which one is your target, understand the numbers, and then to decide how to react or intervene accordingly. So to assist with this, the work of Byron went about to identify species that are present in the orchards. So that would be scalp patches that we obtain from specific growers in all the growing areas. What I'm sharing with you today is just what we regard as common. So these would be eight species, many of them familiar for you. Yes, the two-spot stinkwort remains the most dominant in Luvu, Limpopo, and Pumalanga. We find Nazara species the second most dominant. But what I think is important is for us to understand Burias, the second most dominant species in KwaZulu Natal, but absent in all the other growing areas. And perhaps if we think about these tables and we think about species presence, it's more important that we can actually link that to damage. And that will be damage throughout the season, early or late. So most often we will look at the stinkbug species and we'll look at starlet link being me medium or long. But now we also need to take into consideration the work that was done by Skalk Skuman, and that was specifically a feeding trial study, where he was able to show that the yellow edge is in actual fact able to cause late stink bug damage despite its medium starlet length. And then, for example, Cunomorpha species that we know are not causing damage, despite the fact that we often found it present in scalp patches. So for more information about the total of 20 species that Byron found from looking at about 4,000 specimens, please go and visit our website under the services tab. You can download our stingbug information sheet. So when we think about control, it's about the target and identifying the species. But we are also interested in perhaps understanding where the species come from, because that can help in management. And so in that regard, we often can think about the, the, their alternative host plants. 
And this was then linked to the work of Arista Fouri, where she started off and she developed for us a technique that allows us to identify plants that is then from DNA that she extracted from carefully dissected sting bug guts. Okay? Next, she also did for us what we call is a time trial. Why would that be important? So the sting bug species that we looked at were collected from orchards via grower scouting. So we needed to know up to what point can we still detect the plants that is then from the surrounding orchards. So unfortunately, our time trial is only 24 hours, so we have a very short window. But I am excited today to share with you some of our first data that we have generated, with more data that will follow soon. In this figure, every line represents a sampling. It was either early, late in the season, Limpopo or Mapumalanga. Every color represents a plant. So yes, green is macadamia. It's the most commonly plant detected, expected because we obtained them from these orchards. But for now, I think interesting that we already been able to detect 10 other plant species. So we're making progress in understanding where they're coming from. Perhaps what we need to continue to do and see if we find it again is this specific sample. These are sting bugs that was kindly provided to us by Dan Rock Barberton, and this is green tea. And so at least according to the map, we can see there's a green tea farm approximately 27 kilometers away. So why would this be relevant in terms of control? We can think of reducing the numbers, so early control, but what about trap crops and can we plant them? But a nice add to this is we can use a trap crop in a push-pull system. If we want to think about a push-pull system, we need something that can then repel or push a sting bug outside of the orchard. And so this then links to the work that Elisa Paul has done for us, and that was characterization of the alarm pheromone. Here she started by extracting the glands and she identified 15 compounds. However, next for us was to understand which of these compounds are actually released when the sting bug is stressed. And so here she collected volatiles and she went on to identify those compounds. So she was able to narrow down everything in the glands to six specific compounds. So this is a really busy table, I know, but what I want to show at is that it's not only about what was present, we also quantified the amount. For example, the amount that is present in the highest versus the lowest amount. We often think about pheromones, we think about blends and ratios, so she identified and characterized the ratios. But next we needed to know which ones of these are actually responsible for the alarm. So for something that we can use that the sting bug will move away from. And here she carefully removed sting bug antennae from live insects and she monitored responses. From the six compounds, we only found positive responses of three and we verified this in terms of our behavioral studies. First here we find the statistics, which is that of the number of how far they walked or did not walk. And that comes actually from our behavioral analysis over here. What you see in green is just a software program that mapped movement. You can see when we didn't have anything, we saw little movement, all the way up to the mixture that was all six of the components, as well as the mixture that was the three components from which we also detected an, an antenna response. And so for this, we've actually now quantified an alarm pheromone that we can try and imp implement in a push-pull system. What about some of our other research? So the parasitoids is something that we really want to gain more momentum on. For us, we need to know how many species, which species are out there. For now, we've focused a little just on the vubu, and so we've identified two species. But we've also done some groundwork where we want to set up a system that allows us to work with these parasitoids. And we worked here with Drosorcus basalis that was kindly provided to us by Copper. So where we need to get to is understand how many species are there, are they all present in all the areas. 
then to sample and study them, we need to understand how effectively they can parasitize eggs. Can they emerge? And when we start off and think about species identity, we should actually perhaps not only focus on Tuspat, but also Burias, because these parasitoids have host preferences. Then a final slide, it's on EPFs. So Longili is gonna really give us a great background on her work, but in the small study that we've done, I think it was important that we included four commercial products. And what I want to show here, if you can see the line red, that is our control, you will please note that all four, our commercial product that we included in our trial were actually very effective in killing our labria sting bulb populations. And this is just a picture that is showing the fungal growth on our sting bugs. So to conclude, if we want to focus on control, I hope that our information sheet will help in some identification. We've spoken a little bit about understanding the biology and movement. Of course, much of what we focus on is the use of biological control, but all of this then needs to be combined in a greater integrated pest management system. Some acknowledgements, without funding, none of this would have been possible. Um, the students, I've listed here growers. This is farms that specifically helped with sting bugs for this work, but a bigger acknowledgement for so many people that is assisting us in our research. Uh, Michael and David that helped with sting bug identifications, collaborators of the talk. And then finally, the team, We've all present here today, and so we look forward to talk to you more about our research, and that's research that's not only linked to stink bugs. And so finally, thank you for your time. Thank you, Gerda, really appreciate it. Um, next, I would like to introduce you to uh, Lungile Linda. Uh, Lungile is one of my old colleagues at, uh, at the ARC. Um, she just completed a master's degree. Um, Lungile, I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to tell them how good you did, but uh, <laughs> she did pretty good. Lungile, it's all yours. So, good morning to everyone. I am Lungile, and I'm just going to give you a rundown of the work that I did on semi field assessments of indigenous and somapathogenic fungi. So, in the past decade, the Macadamia industry has increased drastically. Um, with the market size of uh, estimated at $822 million, South Africa is currently the largest macadamia producer, followed by Australia, Kenya, China, and USA. With the increase in, in, in hectares planted, so does the severity of the pest associated with the crop. Which brings me to my insect pest of interest, the two-spotted stink bug. This is an indigenous insect pest which was recovered for the first time in Livubu uh, 37 years ago. When this pest was recovered, during the course of the years, this pest was man managed to um, cover major producing regions in the country and also in neighboring countries. In the previous uh, season, Due to early and late stink bug damage, it has an amounted to over 180 million rand. So from the second nymphal stage until adult stage, that's where they inflict damage on, on the nut. So integrated pest management, I'm sure you've heard it a countless times. This is a broad-based approach that integrates practices to control pest in, in in an economic state. So these practices include uh, cultural practices, monitoring, chemical control, and biological control. The components of this study focused on the biological con control with the use of entomopathogenic fungi. So what are entomopathogenic fungi? Entomopathogenic fungi are ambiguous fungi with insecticidal properties. They are natural regulators which are highly parasitic towards insects, they naturally occur in ter terrestrial ecosystems and are widely distributed. They have been reported to infect a wide range of insects. And how do they go about infecting your insects? Your 
Your spores, they, they start by attaching itself onto the insects. Fungi will germinate on the surface of the insect, then eventually penetrating through the cuticle. As the fungi grows inside the insects, it feeds, it feeds on major organs of the, of the pest or insect and eventually killing your, your pest. On my far right here is the two-spotted sting bug, and this insect was mostly like, most likely died due to natural cause because it remained green. And in most cases, if a fungi, uh, entomopathogenic fungi has killed your insect, it normally turns pink. And then if you induce humidity onto the insect, you'll start seeing sporulation of your fungi. So problems that is currently faced by the macadamia industry is that the two-spotted sting bug is the major pest. If uncontrolled, it may cause losses of plus or minus 80%. Growers rely vastly on chemical insecticide. And sadly, not only the macadamia industry, but certain active ingredients have shown to be less susceptible. So for this study, the aim were to isolate and select highly virulent uh, isolates of entomopathogenic fungi to be incorporated in the sustainable IPM strategies for control of stink bugs in macadamia in South Africa. In this study, um, isolates were previously isolated from stink bug, the two-spotted stink bug, and then lab, tra lab trials were conducted. However, for this presentation, I'll be focusing on the semi-field assessment. So how we went about doing this trial, stink bugs were mass read until adult stage. For this trial, adults were used. The promising isolates were, were grown on rice and the spore concentration was adjusted to two times 10 to the nine conidium mil. We used uh, young macadamia seedlings and we sprayed the trees Immediately after spraying, placed them in, ca in breeding cages and added some stink bug into the cages just to monitor for mo mortality. Mortality was monitored over a three-day interval for 18 days. And for the first trial, we, our treatments had our control, ECOBB, insecticide, and the promising isolate that, that was previously tested under lab condition. Uh, from the results that we, of, we have obtained, the fungi did show some promising results by day 15, obtaining a, a mortality of 100%. However, the mortality only started, the, the fungi only started to respond after nine days compared to our insecticide. Within three days, we have already, already received a 70% mortality. For the, for the second trial, we also obtained similar results. We also added another fungi, which showed a great response under lab, laboratory condition. And in this case, we added uh, acephate as our insecticide. Similar response were monitored where uh, our insecticide had a, a very high mortality within three days. However, our promising isolates only started responding uh, after 12 days. So outcome from, from this work has shown that patho pathogenicity varied between 80 to 100 percent and 80 to 93 percent from the two trials which were con conducted. Fungal isolates can potentially kill insect pests within three to seven days after treatment. However, the rate of speed of kill is highly dependent on the size of the target pest. Mortality caused by Bavaria increased with time from the pilot study which was conducted where it took 12 to uh, 18 days to obtain maximum mortality. So this study formed part of my MSc degree and I would like to thank SAMAC for funding the study and also to the following organization and individuals who made the study possible. Thank you so much.
Thanks, Lungili. Really appreciate it. Um, I think it provides some new insights. Um, next, I would like to introduce you to Elsha. Dr. Elsha Hubert from Levubu. Everyone knows Elsha um, from the Levubu Center of Excellence. Elsha, they do. <laughs> um, she's going to talk about the control of thrips, which I think everyone agrees is a, is a pest that, uh, that we, um, we do not know enough about. Thanks, Elsha. Thank you very much, Skulk. Good morning, everyone. It is such a privilege to be here today and be talking to you. I'm going to tell you more about thrips, and I'm going to start off with a conclusion and tell you that now we know it's definitely citrus thrips on macadamias, and we are going on about how to control thrips in an integrated pest management strategy. Before I get ahead of myself, I just want to say I'm from Levubu, and I want to greet everyone who's in Levubu on the virtual side. I really do enjoy working with farmers so much. We have upscaled, and you'll see that from the presentation. We don't do small farmer trials anymore. We go across landscapes. We see a lot of farmers. We get to the farmers, although the Levubu guys don't see us that, that often anymore. It's because we have really moved into Mpumalanga and KwaZulu-Natal, and that'll come out from what we're doing. So did we control thrips? Yes, but it depends. So first I started asking the farmers, what's your perception around thrips? Um, do you think we can control them? And I went back to the literature to ask what has been done. Let's start there. Some quotes from what I've got back from farmers. And um, first one said, thrips causes significant damage. No two ways about it. And that was five years ago. Then we started thinking, we need to listen. Understanding thrips is really important. Then thrips cannot be controlled with chemicals. Heard it again and again and again. Because of thrips, there's a flower disease and I don't have a crop. I give up. Guys, let's sort out this problem. And the only way to do that is to talk to your neighbor, do it together, and listen to what we've got already for you on the table. This is the research, research that's been done. In 23, first research in, so in South Africa on macadamias found predominantly citrus strips and greenhouse strips. 2006, flower strips in Hawaii destroyed 40% of the macadamia racemes, economic threshold 10% damage. Then you intervene. 2012 and 2015, Colleen Hebert, Michael Stiller reported 15 species of thrips on macadamia flowers in Pumalanga, most abundant species with citrus thrips and thrips tenalis. In 2015, Jeremy Bright published from Australia that there's high numbers of thrips and mite infestations in orchards where beta cyphrothrin were used to control their fruit spotting bug. Rings a bell? Yes. 2016, Svenja Meyer um, Sina, she reported predominantly citrus thrips and thrips tonellus in our orchards on macadamia flowers and showed that there is a positive correlation between thrips presence and nut set. This is what we know, and what do we do about controlling thrips, knowing that there's a lot of people who has already done a lot of work on this topic including the citrus guys. So yeah, I want to highlight work that Tim Grout published from CRI, Citrus Research Institute said, IPM is key. You have to control thrips in an integrated pest management way. Four years ago, um, when Pete Miller started a thrips working group, a brainstorm group, and um, Carlene is here, we spoke this morning quickly, and, and I said to them, without their support and backing to this project, it wouldn't have been at the point where we can already show you results. So after winter, the citrus research found that th thrips emerged from the soil at a ratio of 64 to 36 females to males. There's more females and there's females that causes the damage because they lay, lay their eggs on something that is soft in our orchards and then the larvae start feeding and that's the damage that citrus see on their citrus fruit. 
they said that larvae is the main cause for damage on citrus, and um, you know you cannot export citrus fruit um, with the damage of thrips larvae on it. We also know that adults are attracted to yellow. Citrus thrips adults are, are attracted to yellow. So what did we do? We went back to the drawing board and we figured out a way to design a control trial. We designed the trial across three climate zones. Okay, what's a climate zone? It is a common climate zone and the, this means you have a Mediterranean type of climate or a coastal wind or prevailing heat uh, throughout the, um, a, a dry summer or a, or a wet summer um, and so forth. So what I challenge you to do is to find out in which climate zone you are because that will determine what you can do to control thrips. We used four cultivars, Beaumont, 814, 816 and A4. We included four growth stages, which included two closed raceme lengths and two flush lengths. Understanding citrus thrip, the picture in the top left there, um, we had to go about controlling thrips in all the different ways that considers integrated pest management approaches. And this photo I took of the larvae and the adult with endopathogenic nematodes around them. So the nematodes will enter the body of the thrip and kill it. These are photos of two larvae, a photo of two larvae that I took and the adult, and this is typically the damage on the raceme that we did find, and also there's the damage on the flush. There's the little larvae on a raceme. These are the flowers. This is the macadamia raceme in the closed stage. So focusing on the problem, I'm going to also highlight gains and losses, the solution, and get to the conclusion again. What is the problem? We know raceme damage is significantly different on, on the different cultivars. 816s had significantly more racemes damaged due to thrips in the dry weather um, climate zone. Second on the list was A4. We're looking at raceme damage and then 814 followed by Beaumont. Flash damage was similar in the dry area between 814, 816, and 84, and significantly more than Beaumont. When we look at the correlation between flash damage and the number of larvae per flash, we find that there's a very strong, very steep correlation between the dry climate zone and thrips larvae found on the flush, and the way we went about scouting for thrips was to tap flush five times on a black surface, an A4 surface, and we did this 10 times per tree on 10 trees per treatment block. So 10 times per tree, 10 trees, and we compared it to 10 times per tree, 10 trees in the control in the other half of the, of the block. So what we did here is we looked at 10% damage according to our Y. They said they can tolerate 10% damage. What was the number of thrips there? It's four. That's how I determined a threshold for the dry climate zone, guys. That's how we, we went about. So if you are in the CVA climate zone, which is where my dad farms up in, in Nilespread, um, and I see Panda is here, they, they're farming our, our, our farm for us. Um, it's his birthday today. So I want to congratulate him. <laughs> so I always went back home, you know, thinking it's so different there than it is in, in Levubu. And when I started doing the study, I learned that we're actually in the same climate zone. The numbers that I found in Levubu correlated with the numbers on our farm, but only a few kilometers off, I was in this hot, dry area again. And there, the thrips numbers went through the roof. And we didn't manage to control thrips. So I'm getting to that point now. What to do, where? These are the main culprits. 
I've introduced them, now we know them. We found a whole lot of Thrypstonellus as well, 40.6%. Now, Tasha Gruvier already showed in 2003 that Thrypstonellus was not associated with damage, and this was on mangoes. Thrypstonellus was also reported together with um, that Western flower thrip, which we only found 0.15% of out of 11,000. 765 thrips. Th these two thrips have already been reported not to cause fruit scarring in other crops. And we don't expect them to do, do damage on macadamia. Citrus thrips, 58% of the total number of thrips over two seasons across four different cultivars across three different climate zones. So what's the gains and losses? We lose flush. Therefore, we lose photosynthesis in the trees, we don't build carbohydrates, we don't have energy, we don't have good nut seed, we don't have retention, we don't have mature crops. We're testing this at this moment. That is our expectation and that's what, what I think we are getting to. If you don't have a decent set or you have a mixed set on your trees, what do you do when you need to control thrips on the flowers? and you know that, that you've got a, a crop um, yeah, that you don't necessarily need to spray at, at this moment. So it's a, it's a risk factor. Do we, don't we? We need a threshold. We need an answer to what to do, and we need to do that in an integrated way. So while I'm controlling stink bugs on the nuts, I can also control thrips on the flowers. But while I'm controlling thrips, um, stink bugs on the, on the nuts, I need not spray the, anything or use anything that will kill my bees while I've got flowers as well. And we sit in this situation where you need to make a call and you need to do that in an integrated way, considering pollinators. So we did think about this, we did incorporate it, and in Barberton area, this is what we found. We found a 107% increase in yield after we released predatory mites to control thrips. Without any residue effect, you are able to increase your crop. So that was the nut set with the predatory mites, and that was the nut set without the predatory mites doubled and more. Total yield, nut and shell per tree, young trees um, were used, yeah because we were focusing on both the flush and the flower, and this is really becoming a big problem when you are in an area like CVA and, um, C, sorry, CWA and BSH, which is the, the, the driest spectrum of our farming regions. The solution, so what we've done is com considered three combinations. The first combo is a predatory mite and strategic chemistry combination. So it's got a predatory mite release, followed by nematodes, decoshol and sugar, and another mite release. The second combination that, that we trialed was Bavaria bassiana, metarhizium, then decoshol and sugar, and, and metarhizium. Remember, I don't believe in calendar sprays. So this was not timed weekly, two weeks, or something like that. We sprayed and we released according to scout numbers. When we reached four larvae, on either the racime or the flush. That's the way we went about this trial. The third combo is a chemical combo where we, where we use Dickerson sugar, and this season we are applying delegate 10 days after the Dickerson to see if we get a better result. So back to the components of IPM and what I'm really going on about today is you need to prevent, you need to monitor, and then intervene. When you intervene, you consider biological first, then you go, okay, can I do something combined mechanical and biological, and then only consider chemicals. So many farmers are spraying first, then asking, what did I spray for again this round? And that's the wrong way to go around it, uh, about it. We are going to not waste money anymore and we are going to take care of our environment. So what did we find? In our climate zone up in Levubu, 
we found that combo one, which was predatory mites on the 25th, 28th of August, then 15th of September, Dika Swan Sugar, EPNs released after that because we needed moisture to release the, the nematodes, and then another spray with a chemical um, did significantly re reduce the larvae numbers. That's the total number of our samples there. And then in the dry, dry regions, which is sort of where Barberton is Kumati poor, you guys need to pay attention to this. Combo one, significantly controlled larvae. In this order, according to the scout numbers. Okay, this is the, 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 the adult numbers, and there, there was also a significant reduction in, scout, in, in, in adult numbers. Remember, we scout for adults separate from larvae, but we only respond on larval numbers. And this worked. Then in, the, um, in terms of combo two, Bavaria basiana, metarhizium, a strategic chemical, um, this is the reduction that, that we got significantly on thrips numbers, adults and larvae, and also in the uh, mist belt, let's keep it full. In, in, in the misty belt area worked really well. So you need to know what you're using. Something like a fungus really likes that, that misty um, climate zones. So you can use it there. In the dry cl climate zone, when I pulled all the data after the application, we did not get a significant reduction in adult or larvae numbers with the chemicals. When I used only 10 day data after application, then the, sh the results showed significant effects. So 14 days after the thrips numbers were at four per raceme or flush, we did control them well with a chemical. After that, not. So the bottom line is you need to really take care of your environment because the first principle of IPM is prevention. How do you prevent thrips from building up in numbers in your orchard? The first way that you can do that is make sure that your soil is a healthy system. If you do apply mulches, then it means that something like nematodes and something like endopathogenic fungi can survive in your orchard and they can help you to fight the soil stage of thrips. We can plant cover crops. Um, I saw Jasper this morning. I'm so glad that, that you are here. You know, we've gained so much momentum after, over the past five years in terms of conservation, and you need to take care of your biodiversity in the orchards. We cannot farm on cleared soil anymore. You need to plant cover crops and a combination thereof. And we found very good results in the avocado orchards against thrips with covers. Remember I said that we know that thrips like yellow, and if we can pull them to something that is yellow and r rather have the eggs there on the sunflowers or sun up, why not? So consider biological sprays first, then spray at night, especially during the flowering time, and always conserve your predators, pollinators, parasitoids, and soil life while increasing biodiversity in your, in your system. Biodiversity that really does the work for us includes lacewings. And here's a photo of the lacewing larvae feeding on a thrip larvae. Did you know that it's the larval stages of most of the beneficials that does the job for us? So lacewings are very aggressive predators of thrips. So is ladybird larvae. And so is predatory mites. There's three predatory mites currently available commercially. You can pick up a phone, phone someone and get hold of predatory mites. There's Mondorensis, Cucumerus, and Swirsky. Pirate bugs, Aureus, also available commercially. Pirate bugs are very, very good predators of thrips. They literally control both the larvae and the adults, where mites control the larvae aggressively. Remember, I'm just gonna go back one. Mites don't have eyes, they cannot see. So they do this job 24 seven. When the temperatures are right, they go out and they, they look for thrips or they search for thrips, they, they feel vibrations, they smell. I don't know how they do it, they, they're amazing. They work at night, they work at day, they don't take leave, they don't not rock up. <laughs> plant covers, like I've mentioned, and these are the cover crops that you can plant to attract these beneficials. 
You can plant marigold, fennel, or in the winter, caraway. These all attract either warriors or lanterns. Okay, quality trees, quality soil, and ground covers. This is all prevention in your IPM framework, which includes, it includes chemical sprays, remember. But go back to the, the, the basics and the start of IPM is to prevent. When you know that 816 is the cultivar with the most thrips damage on the flowers, especially in the dry regions, then you need to plan your new plantings accordingly. You need to really maintain the qualities of the tree. Quality is, includes nutrition, water management, pruning. Really make sure that, that you retain your soil health and have ground covers. Have you seen that when you start slashing, your little trees get a lot of thrips damage? So the last thing to do now is to send the slasher in. There's no reason to go out and, and kill the covers now. We're not nearly close to harvesting time. And when you've slashed, you see all the thrips on your flush. And you lose all those carbohydrates, so you don't have that energy in your plant. These are trends that I show you from iLeaf Weather Station. Part of IPM is considering predicting a pest outbreak, monitoring for it while you use all the tools that's available for you. And what I've just mapped here for you is the previous season, 2021-2022, and 2020-2021. So what, what these horizontal lines show you is the predictions according to our weather stations of thrips control based on the final larvae or the, the, the second stage of the larvae, which according to Tim Grout at CRI, is the most damaging larval stage. So very simple, there's a big flat line, there's another line and there's another line. The 20th of September, the 6th of October, and the 25th of October, can't see that far, and that screen's dead. So uh, that was previous season, this is this season, and I, I just put these Date, this, this data onto our graphs of thrips numbers, and this is what we found. The models were able to predict according to day degrees of thrips when we should intervene. This is available for you. We've given this to you to use, and we are now going to talk about how, how do you go about this? How, how do you make the decision whether to spray or not? I've asked the question whether um, rainfall or temperature is an important predictor of thrips outbreak. All of the above came out as significant predictors. So what I've done is I went back to the day degree model because day degrees is a function of temperature and I've plotted rain to simplify. So there's a big rain event, a 45 millimeter in, on the 28th of September, and just after that, we found a big spike in thrips numbers. The models, according to temperature, said that we need to really um, be controlling on that date and again on that date. That's the two horizontal lines from the previous season. Go to this season, there's the two predictor dates from the, the, the weather patterns and what I'm going to show you and this is this is in the in the Levubu climate zone um, also there where, where we farming where I grew up and this is the dry climate zone look at those horizontal lines there is no thing as a calendar spray program it doesn't exist not in biology not in our pests minds so if you want to get it right stick to the biology and use it so these are the predictions according to the weather stations. These are the rainy events, and yeah, rain fell out. Rain didn't, it didn't predict a, a week after rain wasn't a peak in numbers in the dry climate zone. But what was, was the, the growing degree days and also the scouted numbers, four. We used four, and when we got there, we started controlling, which was a little bit too late. Right, And then again, back to the Misty Belt, Kippershaw area, two dates, these are the dates. If you hit the first date right, you probably wouldn't have seen the second um, 
or well, this this peak there probably didn't have to intervene and that intervene, and that is where scouting came back into the picture. So in conclusion, what I've said to you already, it is citrus strips that we need to deal with and sort out. Yes, it has a yield impact, and yes, we know how to control, but it depends on where you are. And it depends on the numbers that you have scouted. So just to acknowledge, we are very grateful to the, the sponsors of the product that we've used in this, this project. It is Ultimate, Entonem, Bovril, Metarol from Coppert. It is Dickershaw from Avima and Delegate from Curtiva. Um, Piet Miller, like I've mentioned, and the working group, um, Dion Bergeman, that came visiting us a while ago, already said to us, it's the citrus strips. Taxon taxonomically, he identified citrus strips. So I think that is laid to rest now. Do Dr. Michael Stiller that helped us, and then all the farmers. Without you, it wouldn't have been possible to do this work. Obviously, my team back in Levubu at the Center for Excellence, they're running around like crazy and getting data from different farms, different areas every week. Thank you. Thank you, Elsha. And I think if I can learn something, um, what I'd like to, like to emphasize um, is that scouting is the way to go. Um, we still got a bit of time. Um, I'd like to open up uh, the floor for questions. Uh, there are guys gonna, that are going to be moving between, between you guys so, um, with microphones. So if there's a question, um, you've got the three clever people here, please, please ask. Um, they're in the hot seat, so <laughs> thank you. There's a question here. Um, with the uh, uh, explosions of the thrips in the orchards, um, instead of spraying, if you were to release predatory mites or, or any of those, would they be as effective? Have you done any research on that or have you just uh, relied on the spraying? So sort of targeting your, your day um, from your, your degree days and pre-releasing predators into that uh, environment. Yes, thanks for the question. Um, I hope you all had got the question. The question was, if we only release mites, did we get a good effect? And the, the answer is yes. We released only mites in Barberton at, um, what's the farm name again? Sweet Home. And there was only mites released there and we more than doubled the yield. It definitely worked and it was a preventative release. Um, and yeah, de definitely I have got confidence in that. Thank you. Andy, I may just ask that it, uh, that farm was a fairly new farm and uh, the chemical usage was not severe. Um, so, so it was, it may be added to... to uh, the, trees, the trees were planted in 2017. There's a question. There's a lot of questions. <laughs> Sorry. Um, just to uh, speaker number two. Um, the releases of the fungi to beneficial um, organisms. When you release fungi, to the, the effect of that in, for beneficial um, Got it. insects. Oh, okay. Uh, some studies have focused on bees mainly, which is of great concern if it will actually harm <coughs> Uh, bees. Uh, with the studies that have been conducted so far, there have been conflicting results with the lab and also field work. But with the field work that have, they have done before is that the, the, the bees are, are not harmed compared to using conventional insecticide. Uh, because of the body structure, bees normally have uh, hairs which inhibits EPFs from germinating onto the, the insects. Thank you. Your, your opinion um, in using the fungi, um, is there any downfall in using such fungi? So with entomopathogenic fungi, you have to be very mindful when to spray because uh, UV in most cases inhibits uh, germination and also extreme heat that also inhibits the fungi from, from actually attacking the targeted pest. 
So as Alshay said previously, that it's, it's more ideal spring at night where there's less UV and cooler temperatures and better humidity. Um, good morning. Also with regards to the EPFs, um, the, the cage that you put, the, uh, you did a spray and then you put the stink bugs in a cage um, on the tree. So this forces the pest to be in contact the whole time with the, the fungi. So do you think this is also relevant in terms if you do an actual field trial and will you get the same results um, on a bigger scale? So with this study, it was mainly a pilot study just to see if EPFs work on, on Stimpak or not and how fast is the, is the response. Um, as I've said, main factors that influence the fungi to, to work properly is UV, humidity, and also the timing of, of, of the spring. So in an ideal world, you have to put those factors into consideration when you are spraying. In your opinion, with the results that you've obtained, um, do you think it's a viable economical way of control? Uh, agriculture at the moment is moving towards a sustainable approach and it's better if you have more options than being limited to, to one product or the same control methods. So we are going to be further doing some work on trying to reduce the mortality, mortality response to be a bit much better with incorporating other uh, products which are currently not registered in the, in the MAC industry. Okay, and then the last question for you. Um, in those 12 to 18 days until full mortality, um, do you observe that the stink bugs are still feeding or do they, um, do they stop feeding once infection of the entomopathogenic fungi took place? They do continue feeding. You, you know, with stink bug, they have such a weird behavior because this was a, just to monitor how they behave. I just placed stink bugs without any food and they're able to survive an entire month with, without food. This was like after the hibernation period. So during the, 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 the trial, the stink bug did manage to continue feeding but maybe during the process of the, the fungi killing the insects, it might have reduced uh, the eating process. Carlene, if I may just add something there. Um, I think what, what, I, what, what I personally think is valuable is that this isolate was obtained from the two-spotted bug. And if you look at the international um, scientific community, uh, what, what can be done is there are various synergies that you could add to the mixture. And I know a lot of farmers in the Nelspread area are using, I'm not going to say what, but they're, they're gonna, they're, 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 there's, there's people using, using some products. Um, there's possibility of using UV blockers or, or enzymes uh, to, to actually help the fungus to penetrate into the cuticle, uh, uh, chitinase being one of them. So, so there are various options now that Lungili has, has done the first initial work. Um, so I think there's, there's, there's room to, to, you know, to, to move forward in. Thank you. Elsha, um, with regards to the thrips control and the spinoteram which you applied, um, did you look at the, the population density um, or, and also the, were there nymphs and adults present or only adults? Uh, thanks, Carlene. We sprayed on larval numbers, and it was when there were four larvae on the closed racemes, and that's when we started with the first chemical spray. Um, Spinetoram was delegate, and we didn't follow up 10 days later, which we are doing this season, and we are monitoring both adults and, and the larvae, and we, we respond on the larvae specifically. I just, I just wanted to get back to the question on beneficials and if there's someone here from um, either Madumbi, Andermatt or Real IPM to get in contact with the, the gentleman there because they've done a lot of work and provided a lot of information 
between um, applications of Bavaria brassiana and beneficials like lacewings, honeybees, and parasitoids. So I think there, there is a wealth of information there that's gathered in the States already. Okay, and then last question. Um, for how long did you monitor the response of the thrips to the spinoterum after the application? We monitored every week, um, two days, six days, and then from there onward, every week after, well, it, it was weekly scouting data that we, that we then coupled with what was done and what was the effect. Did you also look whether the thrips were, um, how many dead thrips and how many sick thrips were found? No, um, we didn't. During the time period? No, we didn't. We just scouted for live thrips that were busy doing damage. Okay. okay thank you. Thank you very much.